or lectures because what's incredible about the brain is that there's so many things that could happen with the brain and of all of the organs, we know so much about all of the organs except the brain. We know a lot about it, but in, in reality, for everything we could know about the brain, we really only know the tip of the iceberg. So the brain has so much mystery left to it that, that uh, it's fun to learn about. So going back and refreshing from last week, neurons form circuits. And we actually learned this in lab when we did reflexes. So we looked. What's the very first step of a, a, a reflex arc? The receptor. You have to have a receptor, and we'll talk about that today. For any sensation in your environment, if you don't have a receptor, nothing works. So my analogy is actually when you look at a computer, the receptors in your body are like the keyboard or the mouse or any kind of input device for the computer. Because the computer has no idea what's going on in the environment unless you actually give it some kind of a sensation through a keyboard or a mouse or some kind of stimuli. Then that signal goes into a central processor, which would be the equivalent to your brain. So peripheral nerves bring in to the brain. And then the brain processes and says something with it. Because a computer doesn't know the difference between an X and a Y unless you've actually programmed to know the difference. So it takes all that information, puts it together. It can do spell check, whatever the software you have involved. It does all this processing, and then it puts some kind of output to let you know that, that everything's right. So if you type the W, the O, and the W, by binary code, just signals of off and on code, basically, like your brain does, it sends it to the, the uh, software in the computer. The computer processes that and says, well, this is what they're trying to type, and then it pops up on a screen. Your brain does the same thing. You sense something. You see something, like the word wow. You send that signal into the brain, you process it, you put these different symbols together and you give it meaning, and then you can actually output and say the word wow. It's a nice little loop. And then like I said before, you have this circuit, and we tested this with reflexes. So sensory input, detecting something in the environment, bringing it into the brain, processing, knowing what to do with it, and then actually doing something with it. So three steps. And of course, neurons are like electrical signals. So it starts at one end, it has to go all the way along. If you're interested in brain disorders or diseases and you want to watch that video for extra credit, you can. What's kind of cool is that the brain's not absolute, remember? So anything along this pathway can be broken. We'll talk about pain today. For pain not to be percepted or percepted, perceived, maybe a receptor's broken. Maybe it's the neuron, the afferent neuron. Maybe it's something in the brain that's broken. So it could be anything along that pathway. If this person's trying to talk to the other person, what if their phone breaks? What's going to happen? They lose all signal. Yeah, they lose all connection. If you cut the cable, same idea. And it's before long, we're not even going to know what these things are, right? Because we don't have telephone cables. In fact, looking at that cord hanging off a telephone, what the hell is that? And then the loop coming back around. Yeah, I'll lose my good analogies. So I really push, especially in the lab, knowing what reflex arc is, the five steps, because that's a reflex, a fast processing pathway. All of your sensations work on the same type of pathway. You detect something in the environment by a receptor. You send the signal to the brain. The brain processes it, and then you send the signal back out to do something with that information. Talk about it, move away from it, respond to it. You do something. Maybe even if it's as, as little as sweating when you get nervous. I mean, maybe you're not outwardly doing something, but it's a response. So it's a pathway. Right. So I put that in a couple times. Right. So when I think about it, I always think of... Basically, everything's hardware, if you know the term hardware for your computers. It's the wiring, it's the chips, it's the drives. But really, all that stuff's worth nothing if you didn't have some kind of software. All the software in your body is in the central nervous system. So what two organs are all the software for your nervous system in? Brain and spinal cord. Now remember, your spinal cord can do processing too, so it's not just the brain. And you, you train it. You learn how to use these things. It's like babies. Now, they have no control of their bladder or you know, their GI tract, so they defecate, they urinate just as needed because their brain doesn't know how to control it yet. But what happens is they learn through processing and learning. They modify their brain so they know when the appropriate time to go is, etc. Do I use too many baby analogy or examples? Okay. So something that was in your lab manual but we didn't really talk about, something called the critical period. I mentioned it just briefly in lab, but the critical period is really kind of interesting because that software, your brain's this cool piece of equipment, but it has no software loaded when you're born. So over the course of childhood, adolescence, adulthood, you're learning things constantly. The first several years of life we call the critical period because all that hardware, the receptors on the, the fingertips, the receptors in the eye, the receptors for sound, 
if you don't learn to write the software for it, they're worthless. So this critical period is this phase where you're learning to use all of the equipment in the body. Um, some of the studies, most famous studies on critical period were actually on kittens. And these two guys, what they did is they took kittens and as soon as they were born, they actually sewed an eyelid shut on, on one eyelid of the cat. So it had normal healthy eyes, normal healthy vision so far at this point, but they sewed it shut. And they waited a couple months and then they, they clipped all the sutures and let it open its eye. But the problem is, the critical period when it should have been learning how to use the eye, it didn't learn how to use the eye. So forever it was blind. It never learned how to use the eyes. Vision was never normal because it didn't learn during that critical period. The same thing happens to people too. What's interesting is our critical period is longer. So, but what they found is that children, like vision-wise, if, if kids have cataracts when they're born and they don't get them corrected, they used to wait until they were like eight and do it because they're like, oh, they're too young. You know, it's too dangerous. But if they waited until eight, what they found is that the kids never actually learned to use the eye properly. Even if they got perfect transplants, they never learned how to use it. So now they try and do the transplant earlier in life so that they hit this critical period and they can learn how to use the equipment. Um, same thing's true with children that are, that are um, like children of deaf parents or children that have hearing problems. A child that has hearing problems, if they don't put tubes in its ear, everything that it hears is muffled. So what's its speech sound like? It actually sounds like a muffled speech. It sounds like what they learned, right? And if you've ever known a kid that had that speech problem when they were a small kid and they got their hearing fixed, did that speech issue go away? No. What's interesting is I live right next to somebody that um, she, has, she has a hearing problem and her speech is kind of, well, it's kind of that muffled speech. And her child has the same speech, but the kid's perfectly healthy. Why? Why did that happen? That's what he heard. Yeah, that's what he heard. So that's what he imitated. When these kids, even if their parents were speaking perfectly to them, because their ears don't work during the critical period, everything they learn to hear with in that ear is adjusted to that, that critical period. That's how they learn to use the equipment. So even if you gave them a cochlear implant or you modify their hearing, they're still going to hear the same way. So it's called the critical period. If you don't learn to use it, you never do. Okay. So kind of the moral of the story is indulge your senses. Get used to it. It's like, like babies. You give them toys. You give them all kinds of things to stimulate their vision, to stimulate their fingers. You talk to them constantly to stimulate their hearing. You're trying to help them develop during that critical period. And this critical period is important for learning to use equipment, but in reality, we still learn based on our experiences for all of our life. So take that trip to Tahiti and enjoy the sun on your skin. Soak it up. So let's shift from the central nervous system and go into the peripheral. And the peripheral is talking about everything outside of what two organs? Brain. The brain and the spinal cord. So everything that branches off beyond it. So put my glasses on for this. So the peripheral nervous system, remember, what are the two main branches? You have this one that goes into the central nervous system and you have one coming out. What do they call the one going in? The afferent. Yep, so you have the afferent division that's sending signals to the central nervous system. That's the input side. And then what's the one coming out? The efferent. Yep. So it's relaying signals from something you've thought about, you've processed, and sending it out to actually move a muscle, control a gland, do whatever you have to. When we look at just the afferent division, what's the afferent doing? Coming out or going in? It's going in. It's going at the central nervous system. You can subdivide that. So you have the visceral, which is talking about organs in your, your gut, basically. So when you get those gut feelings, it's actually visceral sensations. Or sensory, which is out at the surface of your body, sensing your environment. So whether it's vision, or touch, or taste, or smell, or hearing, those are all sensory. Things down inside of you, those are visceral. Like, your visceral control will be regulating body temperature, um, regulating digestion, processes like that, regulating blood sugars. Those are still afferent. You have receptors for those different things. Receptors for blood sugar, receptors for blood pressure that send a signal into the brain to tell you what to do. And we'll talk about that in a lot of detail as we get to each of those organs, like cardiovascular and GI. But for now, let's talk about these. The next concept is something called law-specific nerve energies. Those peripheral nerves, a long time ago, they gave credit to the, the nerves. And this guy, Mueller, said, he goes, the mind has access not to the things of the world, but of our nerves. So he was kind of on the right track. He said that the things you see out there, they're not really real to you until the nerves detect them. So, like... I'll talk about this in a little bit, but ultraviolet light. We don't see ultraviolet light, so does it exist? It still exists, even though we can't see it. So some things that we can't detect are still there. 
So you have these nerves that detect it. Where he was wrong is he said that every nerve in your body basically sends a specific type of signal. So he was saying that action potentials from vision might be bigger than the ones from sound. Is that true? No, they're exactly the same. What's kind of cool about this is there was an experiment that was done later that got a Nobel Prize. Roger Sperry, what he did is he took a salamander's brain and he took their eyes and he cut the optic cord and he flipped it 180 degrees and put it back into the eye. So it seems almost like you can't do that, but if you know anything about salamanders or amphibians, you can cut the tail off a salamander, what happens? It goes back. They have these regenerative abilities. So he took the optic nerve, twisted it around, and plugged it back into the, the eyeball. Let it heal. And what was really interesting is that when the salamander was trying to grab it flies, when the fly would fly up here, because its optic nerve was flipped over, everything that was up here was actually sending as if it were down towards the earth. So it would snap down in this corner. It would see the fly up here and go, Dunk! and try and grab it. And so they figured out that it's not the nerve that's telling where things are, it's actually the brain interpreting the signal from the nerve. And then he did this again, this was kind of a cool one, they did it with a muskrat, which I don't know what the hell a muskrat is, it looks like a weasel to me. But anyway, so this little muskrat, and what they did is they clipped its optic nerve and they clipped its auditory nerve and they switched them. So yeah, it's amazing some of the research that they used to get away with, which was actually really good research. But what was cool is that they taught this little weasel looking thing that every time it saw a red light over to its right side, it would look to the red light and get a treat. And then look back, see a red light, turn and get a treat. When they switched the nerves though, every time they'd show the red light, it didn't respond anymore. Obviously, because they cut the optic nerve and wired it to the ear. But then what they did is they took a keyboard and they went from a really low tone and they started going up one at a time, all the way through the entire frequency range. And what they found is they hit this frequency and it looked over to the right. And it was waiting for a treat. And they tried other frequencies and it did nothing. But when they hit, went back to that frequency, it kept looking to the right. What that told them is that the nerve itself sends action potentials. Does the nerve distinguish between a big or a small action potential? No. no, it's the part of the brain it was going to. So you could actually send the signal from the outside part to specific parts of the brain and trigger that. Nowadays we know that because we can take a, the top of somebody's brain and stimulate one little area when we were talking about proprioception, right? or somatosensory, you can stimulate that area and they go, hey, it feels like you're poking my finger. We know it's the brain, not the specific neurons. So this law of specific nerve energy is really saying that all neurons are the same energy now, but it's the part of the brain that helps distinguish it. So these afferent neurons, you could rewire them to anywhere. In fact, they do that a lot of times when people have surgery and they lose, like, let's say they uh, have an arm cut off and they put the arm back on and they can barely control it, they'll actually wire a neuron that goes to the chest over to the arm, so that when they try and flex their chest muscle, they'll actually lift their arm. So what is that? Would that be an afferent or an efferent pathway that's controlling it? It's efferent. So I gave you an example with Sperry's experiment with, with afferent signals, but they can do the same thing with efferent. These peripheral nerves can be switched and swapped, and they have the exact same action potentials. So we can rewire, which gives us a lot of potential for future research. So now, perception. I love this. Because perception is created. It's your interpretation of the world. You ever been standing right next to somebody and you see the same thing and their description is like totally different than yours? It's the way you interpret it, the way you perceive it. So perception is created is kind of the key. It's made up in your head. You take all these impulses from all the sensations, the environment, and then you put it into this you know, situation. You make it up. So human perceptions do not replicate reality. There's always your perspective and dumb, dumb head's perspective. I almost said the A word. Can I say ass in this room? I think I can. Just checking. Thanks. So like this. And what's amazing is that your receptors actually are kind of sucky. So they're extremely specific. And what's incredible is that you may see this thing out in the real world, but because of your eye, your eye takes all these receptors and then it shrinks it down into only about a million little signals. So you have like 120 million receptors, but you only have 100 million wires that are coming out, or sorry, a million wires that are coming out of your, your eye. So you take a signal like this and you condense it to something like that before you send it to your brain. So that's what you're seeing. But what you perceive is this. So as a baby, when you're learning to use your eyes, everything in your world seems kind of like this, all like choppy and blocky, and you're like, whoa, what is that? But in time, you start learning, well, if it has kind of a round shape here, shiny center, round shape here, shiny center, some kind of a, 
like circular thing, maybe it's a wheel, and you see the shape of the body of the car, and maybe like the window patterns and all of that. And in your mind, because you've past experience, you build this into the car that you see. It's funny because I used to show this a lot, and then uh, like last semester, the semester before, I saw one of these in the parking lot, and <laughs> one of the students actually bought one before she had my class. But it was funny because I I want to go out and take pictures instead of stealing them from Italy or wherever I got this from. But, so here's what it might look like in the real world, and then by the time that signal gets to your brain, it actually looks more like that. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but just to give you perspective, the information, your brain is extremely selective with what comes in. By the way, what's the relay station that's helping weed out all the information you don't need? The thalamus. So you take in about, and I looked this up, but there's no absolute fact, like specifically, but roughly 11 trillion bits of information every second are coming into your brain. So every second, you have enough information to fill 11 hard drives that are one terabyte in size. So that's a huge hard drive. Every second that's coming in. Instead of your brain having to process all that information, it selects the most important ones and moves on. So your brain makes a lot of assumptions, and those assumptions are based on your, your history. So because we're on the, on the Earth, where do we assume our light source is coming from? The sun, above us, way up there in the sky. We just automatically assume light comes from up there. So when we see a picture and we see a brighter area, we assume that's going to be the upside. And I'll show you some of that. So assumptions are based on your experience, your world, how your, you know, how your family, your lifestyle is. And then those assumptions actually become facts in your brain. So if you see something that you don't agree with, in your head you're like, that can't be real. It can't be real. Like this. Look at block A and block B. So remember, in your world, here's the sun over here. Maybe it's like sunset, and the sun's shining over, and it's casting a shadow off the cylinder. Which block is darker? Block A or block B? And honestly, which one does it look like? A. Looks like A is darker. It looks like it. But in reality, if you took this, think they're both the same. They're both exactly the same color. It's because your brain is sort of plugging all this information in. You're perceiving something because of the shadow and the assumption that you have a light source over here. But remember, this is a flat thing. It's not three-dimensional. So, and I used to pass out a, hand, or a sheet and let you fold it up, but you can actually print this slide off and fold it. So watch B. As I pop these up, does it change colors? Whoops. Nope. Look at A. Does it change colors? Still the same. So you know they're exactly the same it's because of those bars connecting it. And you can try that later and fold it. But it doesn't matter. As soon as I take the bars away, what's it look like? B's lighter. Yeah, it looks like B's lighter again. And even though I'm telling you, I'm explaining to you, I'm showing you facts that they are exactly the same color, your brain still says, uh, can't be true. It's not real. You just make assumptions. It's like this. If I just shift the light source around, I can make things look more three-dimensional. So like this, it all, to me it looks like a ball floating in space. But in reality, it's just this solid dot. There's no color change to the dot, but because of this lighting, it almost looks like it's illuminated. But it's all the background. Or like this. I love this one because it's just, right now it sticks, but it looks like a box. What does the box look like to you? Does it look like the box is, this is the front of the box? Or does it look like this is the front of the box? How many people think this block here is the front of the box? It's coming out at you kind of like this. How many people saw it automatically as this part up here is the front of the box? Most people see it as this being the front of the box because where do you usually see boxes? Floating in the sky? Like this? If you saw this, you can see the bottom of the box, right? It would be hovering in, in the sky. No, most people see it sitting on the ground. So, like, if you look at this pers perspective, there's a jack in the middle of the box. So, here are the jacks in the middle of the box here. But they're the jacks in the same middle of the box. It's just perspective. Jacks. How many people played with jacks when they were a kid? God, they feel so old. There, a ball came with that, right? A real rubber ball. Yeah, real rubber. Instead of a digital one you play with with the mouse on this computer screen. So here's just perspective. Like you can see the light up here casting the shadow down. That box would be floating where they were sitting on the ground. Here's another one. Assuming light comes from above, remember there's an assumption. It's not always fact, but if you're seeing the light coming from above, how's this box look? Does it look like it's sitting on the ground or hovering? Yeah, it looks like it's hovering like that, right? Boom, another jack in the box. Those things used to scare the hell out of me. I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> Clowns and jack in the box? No, I don't go for that anymore. But 
Or it could be over here. What well, if that's the corner of a room and the light source is over here projecting that way? It's kind of it's weird because I, I work in my garage a lot, and when I put a lamp on the ground, it just everything seems so different in perspective just because of where the light source is coming from. But that could be an example. Right? Like this. Sometimes your mind just creates depth when there is no depth. How many people can see like the diamonds like going in or coming out? It's weird because as you shift your vision a little bit, you see smaller diamonds or larger diamonds and stuff like that. Or this. How many squares are in the picture? How many people see at least like four squares there? Okay. Most people see at least six squares. In reality, there's not one single square in this picture. There's no square here. There's no square there. None of these things are connected. There are no squares. But your mind automatically plugs things in. Like this one. I love this one. I mean, all of this, this is the same color as that. But because of these four little Pac-Man looking things, you see a square. Or like this. Your brain just fills it in. Right? This is all black through here, but when you stop and you look, your brain's going, what the hell is this? And your brain will come up with an answer. Be careful what you think, by the way. Because you ever have one of those days when you do something that's not probably the best thing to do and you go, why are you so stupid? Guess what? You just asked your brain a question. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to give you an answer. Oh, your, your parents aren't so bright. You didn't go to a very good school. Oh, whatever. Your brain will come up with something and guess what? You just crapped on your whole day because your brain's telling you how bad you are. But your brain fills in pieces. It'll answer questions that you ask it. You just have to wait and be patient. Like this. When it first pops up, you're like, what the heck is that? It looks like a bunch of peace symbols in the middle, right? But then it just took a second and there's that cube again. Right? Or this. How many people can see like a light blue glowing ball in the middle? Yeah, your brain plugs this in. This white and that white are exactly the same. So if I were to cover up these circles here, it would look exactly the same. But your brain just fills in this glowing like orb in the middle. I love it. How many people see chess pieces? How many people see people? Take a second and look at it. So see a nose, see lips. There's their chest, or there's their shirt poking out all the way down to the feet. And then you can see another person facing the opposite direction. How about if I darken it in? Does it make it better? So you can see the people here. How about there? See any people? Jack and Jill. This one? Yeah, this is a really famous one. Vase or face is what they call it. So you've got this like diamond studded vase, this really pretty elaborate vase. And when you take a second and you look at it, what else do you see? Two people's faces. I was at this museum down in Florida. Um, it's an upside down building and everything. It was kind of crazy. But they had one of these vases that spun around on a turntable. And it looked like the two mouths were talking back and forth. It was so cool. Just because all they did is they made this floppy here and here. So that it was constantly going, rub, 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 rub. Like it was a conversation. It's tripping me out. Or like this. We know the horizon. We use the horizon as comparison. You ever looked at the moon like when it's just off the horizon? And it looks gigantic. But then an hour later, when it's up in the sky, it looks like this little tiny marble. It's called the horopter effect. We use a horizon as a comparison. Like these two bars are clearly the same. But when you put tracks on it, something about it just makes the top bar look a little bit longer. So it's an optical illusion. Because we look at the horizon, we look at these lines that are guiding our vision, and it just looks like this bar is bigger now. Your brain plugs a lot of things in. Like those lines, all four of those lines that go across are perfectly parallel. But they look like they zigzag back and forth. We take the environment around it and we let our perception guide us. Or this. This one just screws with your mind, period. Your mind's going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so it's trying to focus on one part, but when it focuses on this area, then it starts trying to figure out what's going over here. And then you move over there, and then it's trying to figure out what's going on back here. So you can actually create animation with a perfectly still picture because your brain doesn't understand what's going on. This is not something you normally see in the environment, so your brain hasn't figured out how to deal with it. Right? So if you try and figure, focus on a black dot here, then it jumps. You focus on it here, it jumps back over here. Or like this. Yeah, they call this one snakes. So there's supposed to be lots of snakes. And it's because of the way these things are lined up, it just screws with your brain. So I actually, I put a picture in the middle of this to try and throw it off. This one doesn't move anymore, but look at all the other ones. They're all constantly moving. It's because your brain's trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Or this. Maybe just kind of like take a second. It almost looks like the middle diamond pokes out and the back one goes in. But if you look at it a little bit different, it looks like 
the outer diamond pokes out and the middle one's back. Your brain just doesn't understand how to work with all those lines and the horizons and the light coming from different directions. So here's another one. I'm going to give you six seconds to memorize the card of your choice. So six seconds. Ready? I just want to distract your attention a little bit. Yeah, I had this real nasty, screamy sound hooked up to it, but the sound always bites on this, so I just had to be the distraction. But I wanted to make sure that you stopped and you didn't get, keep thinking about it. So make sure you remember the, the card that was in your mind. And what's interesting is that I took your attention and I took it somewhere else. So you were trying to memorize something, and I totally distracted your attention and took it elsewhere. What's interesting, though, is do you remember your card? Was that it? Okay. Let's see if I can remove the card that you had. So don't say anything. Let's see. Uh oh, I'm running out of cards. Because they're all different. They are. I thought they were all face cards. Diamonds, yeah, but queens, the jacks. And shapes. King of clubs, jack of diamonds, king of yeah. clubs. Yeah. Okay. Hey. So. You caught me. How many people here chose a diamond as their card? How many people here to chose a jack as their card? So almost all of you. So divided. In fact, it was kind of baited that most people, if I show you that order, I've done this with other groups, but you're the first actual like lecture for physiology I've done it before. But most people will pick the jack of diamonds, which wasn't one of these cards. Really? It wasn't one of these cards. It was the only diamond there. So most people will pick a jack or the jack of diamonds specifically, and it's because I actually led you to the jack of diamonds. Did anybody catch that? Remember what was in the box, the three-dimensional box? A jack. Do you remember what was popping out of the other three-dimensional box? A jack in the box. Do you remember the name of the two kids? Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill. Did you catch the little references to diamonds? Did you notice the studded gems around the vase? I was baiting you. So, oh yeah, you're a fluke. But most people will go for what you bait them for. It's called priming. When you prime your mind, and that's the same thing with tests. Man, with tests, you've got to prime your mind. You've got to clear your mind. You've got to focus on the things you want to keep in there. And your brain will just go. If I gave you an example of, let's say, well, if I gave you the word apple and I gave you 10 seconds to write it down, you could probably all put 10 words that are associated to apple because your brain was primed for it. So... This perception thing is really around attention and perception. So they go hand in hand. They call actually bottom up versus top down. Top down is where you're focusing your attention. When I gave you that big scary thing, poof, bottom up. Your mind is distracted. And I actually wanted to try and take this another step. But after you're scared, how do you feel? Focused. Very focused. You're very on edge. All of your senses are suddenly like heightened. And I really wanted to open up the back door and have Kevin come in with like a mask on and stand back there because as soon as he got close to that, most of you would have started looking over your shoulder because your, your senses are heightened. You're listening for little things because you're scared, right? You ever walked into a room and you just feel bad and now suddenly every little creak freaks you out? It's because all your senses are heightened. You're, just, you're basically taking your perception and putting it where you want it to be or where you need it to be for the time. So bottom up is when something catches your attention. Top down is when you focus your attention. How many people here are great multitaskers? Liar, 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 pants on fire. We all suck at multitasking. It's, we're really bad at it. And the reason is because when you multitask, you actually have to turn one part of your brain off to go to another when you try and focus on different types of tasks. If you're doing constantly the same task, then one area of your brain stays lit up and you're very focused. You can do it really quickly. But when you're trying to balance between, it's hard to do. I have lots of experience for this, and I'll probably show you another one later down the road. But here's just one quick example when they've done research. They find that when you're naming colors, it's actually the left side of your brain that lights up, right? Why left side of the brain when you're naming colors? Language, yeah. So when it's your language, you're trying to associate a name with it. The left part of the brain lights up. But when you're just trying to recognize colors, when you're trying to see things for, for like recognition, it's the right side of the brain. So when you see a color, the right side of the brain is going, oh, I know it. And when you, 
When you see the name of the color, the left side's going, ah, oh, I know it. How many people have seen the Stroop test before? Where you take words like this and you have to read them off. So how about row number one? Just real quick, tell me the four colors in row one. Red, blue, green, yellow. Real quick, right? What if I do this? Now tell me. Red, blue, green, yellow. There was no conflict at all. Now what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you read the names of each of these in row one. Ready? Read them. Ooh, that was pretty quick. How about this one? Quicker? How about now? <laughs> What's interesting is if I had a whole, whole sheet of this, and when I was at Iowa State, we actually did this test with Stroop tests, and we looked at people and their guilt feelings when they got it wrong. It was amazing how slow they got after you give them like 10 of them, and they started really screwing up. They got even slower and slower because of their guilt. But when you show the word red, but you have it in the color blue, the right side of the brain is going, oh, blue, where the left side is going, ooh, it's red. And it's, there's this conflict that slows you down. And uh, our conflict that slows you down. And I'll do a test later that actually goes with numbers and, and letters to test you out with your multitasking. But what's interesting about this, and I really want to do another experiment, see how fast people get when they do this. These are actually the Chinese names for each of the colors. Multitasking is not the best thing because you have to turn off one area to turn on the next. Like if you're focusing on reading and learning and, and stuff, what side of the brain are you using primarily? Reading, learning analytical skills the left side but if you have music going on in the background if, it, if it's music what side of the brain is primarily activated by music and creative things the right your right side is arguing with your left side when you're trying to study have you ever had something on the background you read the same page over and over again and it, like you, you're like oh my god this is such a good episode and you just keep like getting distracted I'm going to try and avoid the word like from now on <coughs> I said that like ten times right there but it's because your brain has a problem. If your right and your left sides conflict, you have to turn off one side or one area to let the other one focus. And when that one's done, it'll let the other one focus. So I've just gotten in the habit of when I do any kind of studying to save time, I do the studying, I get, put it out of my mind, and then I go on to something else. Did you have a question? Yeah, I thought that you were supposed to study, like... The Mozart effect? Yeah. It's actually a myth. It's like the same thing with babies. They did the same thing and said babies are, are more... Um, have a higher intellect if they listen to Mozart when they're younger? No. Yeah. It's kind of like that vaccines cause autism study. It's one study that people were like, wow, look at this. And then it didn't pan out when they tried to repeat it. But. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the tools. Oh, did you have a question? I thought I heard something else. All right. So it's tools for perception. And here what we're going to talk about next. Receptors, pathways, and brain regions. So first thing you have to do is with receptors you have a sensory niche. There are certain receptors that you have and there are certain things that you can't perceive because you don't have receptors. Like for instance, for our environment, our niche, we have the ideal receptors, like color vision. A lot of creatures don't have the color vision that we do. We have it for a reason. It helps us distinguish our environment. Um, but then there's like UV, infrared. There are animals out there that detect infrared or basically can detect heat signals coming off of you. Anybody ever seen the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'm letting you know that's not a real movie. It's not based on real, real life, just in case you didn't know that. But pit vipers, snakes, like rattlesnakes, they can actually see infrared. They see color. So when a pit viper looks at you, that's what it looks like. They can see the infrared radiation coming off of you. So is it easy to hide from a pit viper? No, because if the plants are nice and cool and you're behind the plants, they can see right through and it knows you're there. And that's why when you get closer, rattlesnake starts rattling even more. It's like, I see you. You get a little closer, I'm going to bite you. But, yeah, they have special sensors. Vibrations. Anybody ever heard about animals that take shelter before an earthquake? Mm -hmm. Why the hell don't we do that then? Because we can't hear Right. They detect certain things we can't detect. Or like animals that migrate south every year. I and mean, they have special receptors in their brain that are sensitive to environmental changes, and they know where to go and when to, when to do it. Odorants, this is an awesome one. We'll talk about this too, like pheromones. Most animals, like dogs, they say a dog can smell a female dog in heat over five miles away. But with men and women, we're supposed to be so evolved that we don't have pheromones anymore. These dogs, they smell pheromones, and they smell basically reproductive chemicals in the environment. And I'll talk a little bit about how we actually do, but we discredit it some, too. Anybody ever heard of pheromones? Yeah. You can buy certain colognes or fragrances with pheromones. 
be careful about what you buy because you may buy one that actually repels another person. Right? So sometimes it would be beneficial to have extra senses. Like, man, it would be nice to have infrared if you were that deer right now. Okay, so the receptors. Receptors are basically special endings on neurons. So they can be a standalone ending where they're right next to the neuron but not actually touching, or they can actually be built into the neuron. And we'll talk about different types. Like when you get a paper cut, that thing's built into the neuron. It's constantly triggering it, saying ow, 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 all the time. Other ones we can turn off. So if they're sending too many signals, we can actually shut them off. But receptors go through a process of transduction. And this is bold italics for a reason. When you detect something in the environment, like smell, a chemical for that actually bound in your nose to the receptor, that's a chemical message. That receptor has to send an electrical signal to a neuron that sends an electrical signal up to your brain that turns it into the signal saying, hey, it's a smell. Transduction is shifting it from one energy to another, chemical to electrical, electrical to chemical, mechanical to electrical. All those are transduction. When I squeeze my finger, it's not chemicals, it's actually pressure is turning to an electrical signal going to my brain saying, hey, you're squeezing too hard. Transduction is changing one energy to another. And this last word here, adequate stimulus, I don't want you to misunderstand. Adequate usually means you have enough, right? In this situation, it's saying the correct stimulus. Not that there's enough of the stimulus, it's saying it's the correct one. What's kind of cool is that like adequate stimulus for photoreceptors, what would you detect the adequate stimulus or expect the adequate stimulus would be? Light, yeah. You see light and it flips this receptor and it sends an electrical signal to your brain saying, hey, there's light out there. What's kind of cool is sometimes you can trick it. Like if you take your finger and you do this and you squeeze on the side of your eyeball, not enough to like actually make the jelly squeeze out. But if you squeeze over, what do you, what do you detect? Yeah, you detect that like orangish color light. There's no light there, but you're actually squeezing those receptors and they're malfunctioning. And so they turn on a signal that says, hey, there's a light in this area. But adequate stimulus is typically one stimulus, like light. Sometimes you can screw them up. Here are the receptors you'll have to know. Some of these you can probably figure out. What's a photoreceptor signal sensitive to? Light. So primarily in the eyes, you're going to see photoreceptors. How about mechanoreceptors? What's it sound like? Touch. Touch, mechanical changes. Pressure, squeezing. When I say pressure, there's actually a specialized pressure receptor. It's called a baroreceptor. How do I know it's a pressure receptor? What's a barometer? Pressure. pressure in the environment. So yeah, a special type of mechanoreceptor is a baroreceptor. What do you think that detects in your body? What kind of pressure? Blood pressure, Blood pressure exactly. And we'll talk about that about every other week for the rest of the semester. How about thermo? Temperature, temperature. yeah. Detects the presence or absence of heat. How about osmo? Water concentrations, right. So it's detecting the concentration of water to whatever the solute is. And then chemo is just telling you it's a chemical receptor. So smell, taste, those are chemicals. You get a chemical in your mouth and a chemical in your nose, and the chemo receptors detect that change. And then pain receptors are really special. Most of these are specialized, so they're sensitive to one stimulus, but pain receptors are actually considered multimodal. And their special name is called a nociceptor. Which means, and I'll, I have a slide for this, but pain receptors can actually detect temperature change. They can detect pressure change. They can detect chemical change. But what they detect in those changes are destruction. So when you start squeezing to the point where you destroy tissue, the pain receptors turn on. When you expose it to a chemical that's being destructive, like acids, the pain receptors turn on. When the heat gets so extreme, the pain receptors turn on. So when we talk about a modality, Photoreceptors are specific for one modality, mechano for one modality, thermo for one modality, but pain receptors are the only ones that are considered multimodal. That's the only exception. So modality is talking about what it's sensitive to. All right. So how the receptor works is just like an action potential. So you have that membrane, remember? And then with this receptor, it's, it's basically like a little piece of a cell or sometimes it's an entire cell sitting there at the end of a nerve. And it has these channels. When what rushes in, it's going to depolarize the membrane. Yeah, typically when sodium rushing in, it depolarizes the membrane. When it gets stimulated enough, then it'll turn on the neuron. Right? So those are graded potentials. If I drop a piece of dust on your finger, you can't detect it. But if I drop a bee's wing on your finger, it's enough that it actually stimulates that neuron. So grading potentials 
A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then finally the bee's wing triggered what? I hit what? Threshold. So it's just like a neuron. You've seen this all before. Sodium channels open up. Sodium comes rushing in, depolarizes that receptor, and that receptor tells the neuron, fire, it's time to go. This kind of, man, I, I just so bad want to keep talking about the nervous system, like the bee's wing. That's the lightest thing that can touch your finger that you can detect. Um, light. You can detect a candle lit from 30 miles away in absolute dark darkness, but it has to be absolutely dark. That's how sensitive your photoreceptors are. It's just amazing, our body. So here are two examples of receptors. Here's one that's floating out there that's sitting right next to a neuron. So this gets triggered, graded, 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 threshold, poof, tells the neuron time to fire. Another one can be actually connected to the end, so it's just merged right on. Threshold, 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 firing, zoom, sends a signal down. Like a, like a free nerve ending would be an example of this. It's actually stuck on the end of a nerve, and as soon as you stimulate it, it sends that quick signal. Right. Two characteristics about receptors you need to know. One's called tonic, and one's called phasic. When a receptor can adapt, if all of your receptors were detecting pressure, you have pressure from air pushing on you right now. If all those receptors are sending signals in your brain right now, your brain will be screaming from your skin just all the time. But these receptors, they adapt. They get used to that pressure. When you sit down in a chair, when you're first sitting down and backing up like this, you feel it on the back of your legs. But once you're sitting there for like a minute, you don't go, oh, I'm still sitting on a chair. I'm still sitting on a chair. I'm still sitting on a chair. They adapt. So that your brain can focus on things that are way more important than, hey, you're still in the chair. That doesn't matter. When you start changing your environment, that's when the receptors come back and they reset. So when a receptor is tonic, that means that thing takes a long time to adapt, or it never does. Pain receptors are a good example of this. Pain receptors never adapt. Why would you not want your pain receptors to adapt? Pain is good to an extent. Pain's good because it helps tell you, hey, there's something bad in the environment that's hurting you. Get away from it. If you get a cut on your finger, every time you touch something with that cut on your finger, it goes, ah, what do you learn not to do? Don't touch things with this. Why would your, your body not want you to keep touching with that thumb if it's damaged? So it can heal, right. So you don't introduce bacteria, so you get a chance to heal and everything. So there's a reason that pain receptors aren't adaptive. They're considered tonic. Another receptor that takes a long time to adapt is a baroreceptor that detects what? Blood pressure. Yeah. So let's say you jump on a treadmill. Your blood pressure spikes. Do you want your body to just go, ah, hey, it's no big deal. Let's just reset to 200 you know, millimeters, of, or millimeters of mercury as a normal. Is that good? No, what should your blood pressure be when you take it? 120 over 80, right? So 120 is a nice norm for your systolic pressure. But when you're exercising, that can jump up to like you know, 150, 200 millimeters of mercury. That's not a norm because you can start blowing out capillaries all over your body. Those things you can exercise for an hour, and they're still going, man, the blood pressure is high. So after you're done exercising, it's going to try and bring it back down. Those are really slow to adapt for a reason. That's also a good example because people that have chronic high blood pressure, what do those receptors eventually do months later or years later? They adapt. They go, you know what? If your blood pressure is going to be 180 over you know, 100, maybe this is the norm for us. But here's the problem. When they do things that drives, tries to lower their blood pressure now, what's going to happen? It's going to drive it back up. Their body's going to go, whoa, this is too low. 160 over 90, that's too low. It's going to bring it right back up to the 180 over, over 100. So these tonic receptors either never adapt or they're slow to adapt. And they're usually life-threatening or very important critical receptors. Phasic receptors adapt quick. You expose them, and within seconds to minutes, they're adapted. You sit on the chair. The receptors in your butt that are not pain receptors, when they hit the chair, it takes you a few seconds before you're comfy, you shift your butt, and you've got that groove in the chair, right? You're comfortable there. That actually felt awkward seeing like this. <laughs> Photoreceptors, light receptors. When you look at a room, it takes you like milliseconds to take a basically a snapshot of the room and know what things are. You kind of understand where everything's at. And then when you, you're sitting there, then your brain can go into other things and you know what is out there. Like when you stare at something for a long time and you look away, because your brain's so used to it, those receptors had adapted to that thing and now they're going, whoa, something changed. We'll actually test this today. This is an example of phasic. 10, 15 seconds, and those photoreceptors shut off. Like, we know, we know the wall's there. Forget about it. It's not changing. So things like light receptors. 
We did temperature receptors too in a lab where you stick your finger in different temperatures. Or for some of you, that's today. So if I were to ask you a question like this, when you leave the class, the hot air outside hits you, you perceive the change in temperature, and then by the way, a minute later, you're fine. What is that? Is that tonic or phasic? It's a phasic receptor. It detects quick change and it adapts really quickly. I always think of phasers like those little guns in Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever. Real quick, change. Just trying to help. Would it also be true that then the phasic receptors are more towards the outside of the body and tonic are more on the inside? Mm, that's a good point. Um, I, I would it's lean towards if that helps you, but think of pain because yeah. pain is primarily on the outside well, of the body. You wear too. a t-shirt that's on the outside of your body, but you're constantly not thinking like I'm wearing a t-shirt. All right. It, it depends on the type is kind of the way to think about it. So if that t-shirt were causing you pain, like shingles, Man, to wear a t-shirt over shingles, ugh, that would, that would be hell. Yeah. So it, it depends on the receptor, not so much the location. Right. So let's talk about that pain pathway. What's kind of cool about pain is that I told you already that these receptors, they're specific to a certain thing, but they're actually kind of like blunt tools. They're blunt in instruments. They don't tell you exactly the precision. They don't tell you what type of pain all the time. They just tell you generally, pain sharp, pain dull, ugh. So it's really blunt. What's kind of interesting about the pain receptors are the same receptors that detect itch. So when something's irritating you just enough, you go, eh, that's irritating, uh, and you itch. Okay? They're the same ones that cause tickle. So if it's really mild, it causes tickle. A little stronger, it causes an itch. A lot more, it causes pain. Same receptors. It's your brain perceiving the intensity of that signal. Right? Is that because of big action potentials versus little ones? It's more. It's frequency, exactly. It's because of more action potentials. A little light tickle, right? Low action potential frequency. A little bit deeper, you're like, oh, it's kind of, get away from me. And then a little bit more, you're like, ow, screw you. But this pathway is called the somatosensory. So what part of the brain is it going to? Well, let's start at this. What lobe is the somatosensory area in? Yep, in the parietal lobe. And it's called the somatosensory cortex. So if you look at the pathway, the first signal we call the primary or our first what? What's the name of the neurons that come into the spinal cord? Afferent. afferent. Yeah. So you've got this first order or the primary afferent neuron coming in. It comes up. Oh, look at that. What's that thing that sits just outside the spinal cord? It's a cell body. Yep. It goes into the back part of the spinal cord and then it crosses over. Where it crosses over is actually where it connects to what we call the second order neuron or a secondary neuron. So some of these sensations will be at the level of the spinal cord down here. So let's say a signal comes in my leg, it crosses over at the leg and goes up to the opposite side of my brain. Some of the signals will go all the way up my spinal cord and then at the medulla oblongata, there they cross. And it's called contralateral. It goes to the other side. So either cross over the spinal cord or the medulla oblongata. And then once it gets up into the brain, where do all sensation signals go to? Thalamus. When it gets to the thalamus, then it goes into a third neuron. So here you can see the primary crosses the spinal cord at the secondary, goes up into the actual brain, into the thalamus, and goes to a third. And the third order neuron goes out here to the outside surface. What's the outside surface of the brain called? Cortex. cortex. Yep. So it goes to the cerebral cortex to whatever sensation it is. And this is just a sensation for, for a sensate, well, somatosensory sensation, touching goes up to the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. If it were vision, it's the same type of pathway. You've got a receptor out here, you've got a, the primary afferent that's coming in, goes to the thalamus, goes from the thalamus and goes right up into the occipital lobe of the primary visual center. So same steps. When I talked about this the other day, the somatosensory cortex, this is actually a layout. So if we were to slice your cortex across here and tell you or draw a picture of every body part that it's sensing, you could see the layout of the body. It's kind of a weird body though. Like your face is here, your hands here. Most everything from your toes all the way up to your armpits is in this little section. This is the number of neurons that are sensitive to that body part. So what parts of your body are the most sensitive? They have the most neurons. Fingers. fingers face. And the face. Yeah, the fingers and the face. This explains a lot. When you're a baby, what do you want to do with everything you get close to? Grab it and put it to your face and your mouth, right? So you can see lots of neurons dedicated to just the face and the hands. Look, basically from here all the way down 
to there. Throat, face, hands. So about two thirds of this entire surface of your brain, the cortex of the somatic or cortex, are dedicated to the hands and the face. The rest of the body, not so much. Every time I see this, so when I was in grad school, I, the person that was teaching me this, she's great, she's awesome. She was actually one of my on my uh, thesis committee for a while, and but every time that I see this, I think of her because she was going through a bad divorce at the time. And she said, no way you remember the genitals. Is it, see the foot? It's smashing his genitals right into the ground. And she was from New York too, so she had that little bit of a snap and accent. But it's just funny because I never forgot where the genitals were. Never, ever forgot. But this little guy they call the homunculus, if you look proportionately, look at how big his head is and how big his hands are. It's because if you were to take every neuron and dedicate it to the size of that body part. You can see the hands and the face are huge, but look at the tiny body in between. We talk about this in lab and experiment with it a little bit, and this is called receptive field. And receptive field is talking about the number of neurons per space on your body. I don't want to use a specific unit. So let's say I have an inch in this example. This is an inch wide right here. This one neuron is sensitive for that one inch. If I touch anywhere in that inch, this same neuron gets triggered. Can I tell the difference between this receptor and that receptor if they're both going to the same neuron? No, it's like having Morse code machine, right? I have a Morse code machine with five buttons here, but they all go in the same cable to a little sensor on the other side of the room. Can the person on the other side of the room tell which button I hit? They all sound the same, right? Beep, 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 beep. No matter which one I hit, can they tell which one I just hit? Not a clue. Your brain's the same way. When you touch anywhere in this area, it hits one of these receptors. That same neuron fires and says, oh, it's that part of the skin being sensitive. So that's the receptive field for that area. That's a large receptive field. Okay? When I have a small receptive field, it's saying that for this half inch, I have these three receptors. If I touch in this half inch, this neuron gets fired. If I touch in this half inch, that neuron gets fired. My brain can distinguish this one from that one. So if I take the same pair of calipers, a little device, and I poke one inch apart, in this area, it feels like I'm touching one, one spot. In this, I can distinguish between those two points. Where are going to be the most sensitive spots on your body? Obviously, the face and the fingers. Yep. That's why you can read Braille with your fingertips, right? Not your butt cheeks. If you were trained, you could probably read Braille with your lips, too, because they're so sensitive. Okay, so the key here is in the bold, but acuity for sensation refers to the discriminative ability. So it's how accurately you can discriminate. Can you tell those two points on Braille that are one millimeter apart? Even on the back of your arm, you probably wouldn't be able to distinguish it, or on your shoulders or your calf. There we go. Next is lateral inhibition. These are together because they look a lot alike, but they're not the same. So receptive field is talking about how easily you discriminate from an area, where lateral inhibition helps you localize one specific spot. So what it does, and localization is the key, if I were to poke on your finger with a pencil, and I leave a dip right at the very tip, that's the neuron that gets the most sensation. But you also bend the skin around that neuron, right? So these neurons are going to get stimulated too. And this is kind of a, like a fuzzy gray to your brain. It's going, well, geez, all these are getting fired. It seems like this one's a little bit more sensitive, but you know, not so clear. So what's kind of cool about your periphery is your neurons have devised something that says if this guy is going to fire, it's going to shut off its neighbors. So that this signal down here that's going in the middle is the one that's the most bold to the brain. The brain can easily distinguish that that is the spot right there. So here's how the neurons look. You've got this one neuron you're poking in the middle. It branches off. Does it diverge or converge? It diverges. Two of those branch waves will actually go to the surrounding neurons and inhibit them. They hyperpolarize. So it's harder for them to hit threshold, which means this one signal in the middle goes to the brain, but the other two around here don't say anything to the brain. They're just quiet. It's almost like taking a, a gray picture and putting black lines to surround the images so it makes it a lot clearer for you. That's what it does for your brain. It easily localizes where the sensation's at. So if I give you a question like this, lateral inhibition is important because of what? Lateral inhibition. What does it do for you? Yeah. 
So what's wrong with number one then? If I poke you with that pin, does lateral inhibition keep you from feeling that pin? No, you're still going to feel pain. So it helps us precisely locate. So location was lateral. What was, well, what's this then? Defines a receptive field. It's actually, yeah, receptive fields. So discriminating the, strip, or the receptive fields. How it tells our brain about what type of stimulus it is. Could it do that too? Kind of? Could it? If I take a paper clip and open it up and I poke you on the finger and I take a pencil and poke no, you in no. a spot like it, can you tell the difference? You can just localize, right? So not in this situation. It's when you take lots of neurons together that you can actually feel it. Like if you took that paper clip and actually put it in your, your hand, you could feel it because of all those neurons working together. Going to the brain, you might go, hmm, feels like the shape of a paper clip. And if you put it in your fingers, you can definitely tell. And it's called graphesthesia. Good job, everybody. OK, so pain. Again, I kind of gave you this example before. So pain receptors. Are they specialized for one specific sensation? No, they're the ones that can actually overlap modalities. They're the only exception to the rule. In general, you can say that there's one receptor for one modality. Pain is the only thing that overlaps. Pain's protective. So is it going to be tonic or phasic? Tonic. If it's a protective mechanism, it takes a long time to adapt. Or in pain situation, does it ever adapt? Nope. And we call them nociceptors. So. Different categories of pain receptors, you have mechanical, thermal, and polymodal. Like I said, polymodal is what you typically have, and polymodal is across the board. If I drop hydro hydrogen ions, which is acid, on your finger, it burns like crazy. If I put fire under your finger, it burns like crazy. You really can't distinguish the difference. They both burn like crazy. It's detecting the same sensation, chemical and thermal. Right? You ever smashed your hand and it just feels like your hand's on fire? Mm -hmm. Same thing. So. Mechanical damage. These are extremes. I used to love, before I even knew anything about the brain when I was in high school, I was kind of a jerk. Some things never change. But anyway, when I worked in a restaurant, we would take, I was a cook there, and we would take those hot plates for steak that are metal, and we'd spritz them with water, put them in the freezer overnight. And then when somebody would take us off the next day, we'd put them in, in tongs like they were hot. Because when you pull out the freezer and it's a human environment, what happens? Like steam's coming off it, right? It looks like it's steaming it on fire. And that person that take you off, you walk by, and you bump their arm with that freezing cold plate, and you go, hot plate? What'd they do? <laughs> they freak out, and they, they scream like they were on fire, like their skin was burning. Because to their brain, they felt that intense cold, and it felt painful, mildly painful. I don't want to sound like that big of a jerk, but mildly painful. And what did their brain say? Fire, fire, put it out. And they're going, and they're like, you know, trying to put it out. And of course, you'll laugh like crazy, and then you hold on to the plate just to show them. But and it's because of these pain receptors. When it's an intense extreme of temperature, it makes you feel that pain. Uh, if you ever watch the Punisher movie, I love. Popsicle. Anybody not. Yeah, the popsicle. He says he's going to burn the guy's skin off. And what he does is he actually sizzles steak and puts a popsicle on his skin and makes him think he's burning his skin off. So. Next, prostaglandins. And now we're going to talk about some chemicals. There aren't a lot of chemicals you have to memorize, but prostaglandins are going to be one of them. Prostaglandins are interesting, and, and I know that you've all battled prostaglandins before. So prostaglandins are actually the cell membrane, whether it's a neuron or any of the other skin cells. When you damage that membrane, it releases these things into the environment called prostaglandins. The membrane broke, it's damaged, and it turns into this prostaglandin. And the prostaglandins lower the threshold of activation. So if I drew you a chart like this, lowering the threshold means that I bring the threshold down like this. Here's my resting potential. Normally thresholds at like 55, right? If I lower the threshold and I bring it down to 65, have I triggered a response yet? No, but what did I just do? I made it easier to trigger threshold. I sensitized that tissue. When you go out in the sun for a long time, you get exposed to UV radiation, you're destroying those cells. They're, the cell membranes are releasing prostaglandins. So when you're out in the sun all day and you come inside, you feel fine, right? The prostaglandins didn't trigger pain, but what happens when somebody comes up and grabs your shoulder? <sighs> right? Normally, if someone put your hand on your shoulder, your, their hand on your shoulder, you're fine. But in this situation, because the prostaglandins have lowered the pain threshold, now it feels like they're just ripping your skin right off your body. That's what a prostaglandin does. So they lower the threshold for pain. All right. So pain relievers, 
I don't think this slide is actually in your nose, but pain relievers, when you look at it, if you understand the pathway, pharmacology is going to be so much easier. You have a receptor. The receptor turns on the signal. It detects the, the pain signal, right? And it goes from the receptor to a what? What kind of neuron? A sensory, a sensory neuron, which is also known as an afferent, afferent right? So afferent, and then it goes to what? Your spinal cord and up into your brain. If you understand the pathway for pain, you can either turn off the pain at the receptor, turn off the pain at the axon, or turn off the pain where it goes in the spinal cord. What's the other alternative you could do? What's the last place? Turn off their brain, right? So there are lots of different pathways. When you start looking at pharmaceutical agents out there, you're going to find that pain relievers work on either the receptor area, the axon, or typically the central nervous system. So when somebody takes an aspirin-like drug, aspirins actually stop prostaglandins from forming. So aspirins get in there, and before that membrane can turn into a prostaglandin, it stops it. So what's it do to pain? It stops the pain. It prevents the pain. So what it's doing is it's not reversing it. It's just making it so if you already feel pain, you take an aspirin. It's just making it so it doesn't get worse. If you take an aspirin before you have the pain, then you don't feel the pain as much. The next ones are sodium channel blockers. So sodium channel blockers block sodium channels. What ion moves into an axon to cause that pain signal to travel? Sodium. If you block the sodium channel, can sodium get in? Nope. So what can you not get on that axon? Pain. You can't get an, an action potential. If you block the action potential, you could smash that receptor, you could rip that tissue apart, but no signal gets up here. It's like cutting the telephone line and then robbing somebody's house. If they pick up the line to call the police, does it help? No, it's no good. Well, yeah, they have a cell phone now, right? My old analogies don't work so well without good old-fashioned telephones. But sodium channel, when you go to the, the dentist, what do they give you to help you not feel pain? Novocaine. They inject that Novocaine in there, it's a sodium channel blocker. It blocks this neuron. So that you can still feel pain around the rest of the body, but this area of the mouth can't feel it. So they get in there and they rip out the tooth or do whatever they're doing. They dig around with that grinding. Just making you think about it a little bit. I'm bringing the pain to you whether you like it or not. But So you can hear them in there grinding and normally your tooth is in there going, ah, this hurts, right? But the wiring that sends a signal to the brain to perceive pain, what happened to it? It's blocked. Yep, it's dumbed down. It's muted. So Why does it hurt so bad to get Novocaine? Then? Like it kills going in. The initial going in because they're not numb yet. Oh it's when they jam it in because all those neurons are sensitive right now. They're destroying tissue going in. And then they expand it out and they stretch the neurons. And the neurons are going, ah. But after that, Novocaine actually hits those, See, those axons. Are, it Novocaine shuts off. Novocaine hurts worse than normal shots. Right. So... My dentist is pretty, he's clever. He understands pain and he'll like pinch another area and distract you while he's putting it in. Bastard. <laughs> Sneaky. But, so knowing that, why do they inject it just in that area and not put it right into your blood vessel? Right, you want it there. What would happen to every neuron in your body if they just put it in your bloodstream? They'd all, you'd die, right? They'd all shut off. You would get no signals to the brain, in or out, right? You'd die. I wonder if they've ever done that to you. That would be bad. So, what did you think of the last Tuesday? Oh, crap, I just shot that right in the artery. It was an accident, right? We'll just dump his body in the lake. <laughs> yeah, my mind, it's way out there. You don't want in here. It's dangerous. So... Narcotics are the next ones. And narcotics work on the CNS, the central nervous system. They don't work at the tissue. They don't work on the actual axon itself. They get into the brain and the spinal cord and they make it, the pain get muffled, turned down. So narcotics like opiates, morphine, heroin, they do that to people. They go in and they relax the person. They get other areas of the brain they actually make them feel high. So we're going to talk about opiates just a little bit. So again, you have damage out here at the tissue. You can stop that signal either at the tissue by blocking prostaglandins with things like NSAIDs or aspirin. You can block it with things like, um, I have a brain fart, dentist's office. No, Novocaine, ahead. thank you. There are sodium channel blockers up here at the axon. Or, I'm about to show you, you can block it at the central nervous system with opiates. So that signal from the afferent never gets into the spinal cord. Or, once it gets in the spinal cord, it actually gets stopped at the brain stem. So you can see the pathway here and you can see close up. 
here's where we're going next, the opiates. Opiates work right here, and they block the release of neurotransmitters. So the signal comes flying down here, but that neurotransmitter never gets released. So what's this postsynaptic neuron think? Nothing. Doesn't exist. No, doesn't exist. So two types of pain fibers, and the two types of pain fibers are based on the two things that control speed. What are the two things that control speed of an action potential? Myelin. Myelin and diameter, right? So you have the fast pain pathway. The fast pains are called the A-delta fibers. You actually have other sensations like A-beta that are extremely fast, but these A-deltas give you a sharp pain. It's a quick signal. You touch the tip of a razor blade, ah, you pull your finger back really quick. That signal shot way up in your arm. Of course, you know the weak withdrawal reflex, but it also sends a signal up into the brain. It's a fast response. So these can move about 30 meters per second. Some of them can actually, actually like the A betas, even faster, about 250 meters per second. Whew. That's the length of about two and a half football fields in one second. That's a fast signal. Right? Slow pain fibers, those are the ones you ever have like the crampy feeling where you're like talking to something, you're like, ugh. They don't set in really quick. You almost feel like the pain's creeping up on you. You're like, what is that? Oh, yeah, that's not good. And then you just like, buckle over. That's slow pain. Those are called C fibers. They either have no myelin or very barely any myelin at all on them. So if you describe the size of these two, we already talked about myelin. Fast pain has lots of myelin, slow pain, very little myelin, which tells you slow pain, slow signals. What about the size? Which of these is going to be a larger diameter? Fast. Yep. So the slow pain are little tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny wires, basically, that have barely any insulation around them. Fast pain, big tubes, lots of myelin. Okay, so if I ask you a question like this, pain pathway that carries a sharp prickling pain sings signals as fast as 40 meters a second. So the key here was fast, right? Is it going to be the A deltas or the Cs? It's the A deltas. It's the crampy, lingering, like, gut pains that, you know, when they came on. By the way, those gut pains, do the pains go away quickly? If you take some kind of an um, analgesic, it's like waiting and waiting and waiting, and then later someone goes, hey, how's that headache, or how's that you know, gut pain you had earlier? You're like, oh yeah, I guess it does feel better. So it turns off just as slowly as it turns on. Good job. Right, next chemical, bradykinin. So prostaglandin did what to the threshold? It lowered the threshold. It sensitized you to pain. Like I said, that sunburn was a perfect example. Bradykinins aren't that patient. Bradykinins cause the pain now. So when you damage a tissue, the bradykinin is released and it automatically starts triggering. It turns on the pain signal. So it stimulates the polymodal receptors. And the polymodal receptors, are you going to easily be able to distinguish whether it's a fire or extreme pressure or chemical burn? No. These are the ones when they turn on because of the damage, it's telling you, you've got to get out of here now. We're, it's like lighting a fire under your pants pun kind of intended. It's trying to get you out as fast as possible. But this bradykinin triggers a slow pain pathway. So once you're away from the bad stuff, does that pain go away right away? No, it like lingers. It hurts. And the bradykinin you usually contributed to inflammatory response. So it's actually a cause of inf inflammation and it's also a result of inflammation. Both. Like if you get a if you get hit in the arm with something, it kind of like that dull, burny, achy pain that lingers. It's bradykinin. And then the last two chemicals, substance P and glutamate. Substance P and glutamate are neurotransmitters. So bradykinin and uh, the prostaglandins, they're more chemicals that are released from the damaged cell into the whole extracellular fluid. They just dump out in the environment trying to trigger any neurotransmitter they can. These two are actually neurotransmitters themselves. Actually, I'm going to ask you a question. Substance P is a long chain. It's a big, it's, like, it's a peptide. It's a long chain of amino acids stuck together. Glutamate's one amino acid. Which one's going to be associated with a faster signal? Glutamate. Substance P is the slower signal. Slow to turn on, slow to turn off. Now I always remember P for pain. Substance P causes pain, pain, pain. Does everybody feel pain the same? No. And even if guys did feel pain the same as a woman, there's no way in hell we'd admit it, right? 
So that's why they have those machines like at arcades and stuff like that where they hold the pain thing and the guy's going, yeah. At the same time, he's wetting his pants because it hurts so bad. You know who I'm talking about. So the signal. Where's the first place the signal goes in the brain? Thalamus. Just like every other pathway goes into the thalamus. Once it gets into the thalamus, the thalamus redirects it and says, where do we need to send this signal? And it's going to send some of the signal up to the somatosensory cortex and say, hey, you're feeling pain, and it's specifically in this region. Let's get out of here. But it's also going to send that signal to the reticular formation. Where was it at? In the brainstem. Yep. Went right through the pons. What did that do for you? Made you feel either sleepy or more awake. So when it's turned up, it makes you feel more awake. When it's turned down, it makes you feel sleepy and drowsy. So when you feel pain, it's going in and stimulating the reticular formation. What's it going to do to you? Make you feel awake. So the next time you're driving home and you're tired and you think, oh, I should get a coffee, forget it. Coffees cost money, right? Get out of the car, slam your hand in the door, <laughs> and then get back in. You'll be wide awake, I promise. Not happy, but wide awake. Right. So here's the sample pathway from your book. Here you see, here's the receptors out in the environment. Some kind of noxious, noxious means painful. So destructive, painful stimuli, whether it's a fire or some other agent, stimulates this. The signal goes up the axon, afferent axon, past the cell body to the terminal, and releases substance P. Is substance P fast or slow? It's slow. It takes its time going across here. It finds a what? What's it looking for? A receptor. It finds a substance P receptor, binds to it, turns on this postsynaptic neuron, sends the signal up to the brainstem where it triggers the reticular formation, the pons, and then goes up to the thalamus to send it to the somatosensory cortex to say, hey, the pain is at your whatever hand. What's cool about this pathway is when the thalamus and the reticular formation are turned on, they will send a signal over to the limbic system, the, it, the hypothalamus and the fight or flight the instincts, and turn it on, and you get some kind of behavior response, like running away from it. You get angry about it. You do whatever, you know, freezing, feeding, fighting, fornicating, whatever. So it adjusts all those different things. You get a response, a physical response. That same pain sensation you can stimulate with chemicals. Can your, can your mouth tell the difference between fire on your mouth and hot sauce on your mouth? It feels like burning, right? Uh, either way, you touch hot pizza on your mouth, what do you start doing? Drooling really bad. You put a hot pepper on your tongue, what do you start doing? Drooling really bad. Your brain doesn't know. It doesn't care. The chemicals in the hot peppers trigger these same receptors that heat does. And it's telling your brain, oh my god, there's so much damage here. And it's sending the signal. It releases substance P. Substance P goes up to the thalamus and turns on that signal. It says, ah. Oh. So I've always wanted to do it, but get like a ghost pepper and leave it in the trunk of my car. And if I ever feel tired, just go out and get it, grab it, and eat it, and see if I wake up the rest of the ride home. I always forget that when I walk out of here. Okay, so analgesic system. I already talked about this. You can stop the pain either here with what kind of chemicals? Things that are in your cabinet. Aspirin, NSAID, right? So it stops the pain here, prevents prostaglandins and bradykinins. Here, whoops, sorry, here at the axon, what were you thinking? Blocking sodium channels. And then down here, what was the last one I talked about? Opiates. What's kind of cool is that you actually have an endogenous analgesic system that will stop this pain right here. So, whoops, what happened? You don't want there. There we go. So, that analgesic system that's innate in your body, it stops substance P. It turns it off. Substance P is a slow burning pain, remember the C fibers. So, opiate receptors are actually on here, and I'm going to show you the picture. So, you have opiate receptors on the terminal of this afferent neuron. When you feel the pain, the reticular formation will send a signal down all the way down, it says dump the opiates. So the endogenous opiates, things like endorphins, and kephalons, those are different types of opiates. They bind to these little opiate receptors, and they allow what chemical to go in? What do you think that minus is saying? It's saying inhibit, but not sodium. Chloride. Chloride comes in. What's chloride do to that cell? Depolarize, repolarize, or hyperpolarize? Hyperpolarizes it. It makes it harder to hit threshold. If you take an opiate, you can still feel pain. It's just harder to get the pain because here's your threshold, right? You just took and hyperpolarized that neuron, so it takes more stimuli to get to the same level. So that's what an endogenous opiate does. Alexander the Great, and actually Aristotle, um, 
whatever. I don't, I don't want to discuss philosophy, but Aristotle was actually, he practiced medicine and he talked to Alexander the Great and said, hey, if we take this poppy extract, poppy seed extract, and you give it to your warriors, they don't feel pain. They're like demons. They will fight and fight and fight, and they don't feel pain basically until they're dead. So Alexander the Great just loaded up all of his, his warriors with basically morphine. That's smart. Yeah, and then sent them into battle. And it scared the hell out of people because they would stab this person, the person would go, oh, and like still keep fighting. So, and we had no idea what was going on back then, but it worked. So, the little Greek philosophers, they were pretty bright. So, anyway, that's the same pathway. The opiate receptors are sensitive to exogenous opiates just the same as they are to endogenous opiates. So you take this exogenous opiate, morphine or heroin or whatever, and it goes in and it blocks the pain signal. It turns it off here so you don't release substance P. If you release substance P, then you turn on this opiate receptor, what happens? Once it's out, you still feel the pain. Yep, so you need to actually hit it beforehand, not wait until afterwards. So you're trying to prevent it, yeah. Being on pain medication. Oh, so when they get tolerant? Yeah. So after a while, these receptors, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the endocrine system, but these receptors, they're up there, and when they're over-abused, they'll actually start turning off. Your cell won't turn them on anymore. So it doesn't matter if you have the opiate there, there's nothing to bind to. It turns it down. It's called down-regulating it. So it's less sensitive. It's the same idea with insulin. And so when we get to the um, endocrine system, we'll talk about that too. Like people are desensitized to insulin too. Okay, so endogenous opiates work by doing what? What do endogenous opiates do? Do they enhance or release a bradykinin? No. Think about this first. What's an opiate do? Does it cause pain or remove pain? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it removes or prevents the pain. So what's a bradykinin do? Mm-hmm. It causes pain. Is, it going, is something that removes pain going to enhance a pain causer? No. no. So sometimes if you don't remember what the heck bradykinin is, or what the pathway is, go, well, bradykinin causes pain. Definitely not. Opiates should turn it off. So get rid of that one. How about inhibits the release of substance P? So where do opiates work? Do opiates work out here at the receptor? Do they work on the axon, or do they work in your brain and spinal cord? Brain and spinal cord. They work on neurotransmitters. What are the new neurotransmitters? Glutamate and substance P. So they block substance P. If substance P causes pain and opiate prevents it, that means opiates inhibit the release of this stuff. Would they enhance the release of histamine? We didn't even talk about this, but what's histamine usually associated with? Swelling, allergic reactions, right? So no, that's causing pain. And then blocking the release of prostaglandins. Where did prostaglandins, where were they released at? Central nervous system, the axon, or the periphery out here at the receptor? The receptor. What blocked the release of prostaglandins? Aspirin and NSAIDs, right. So just remember in general, when you get into pharmacology, it's funny because I actually got an email I was going to share with you this week. I had a student that was in last semester's class, and she went in, into pharmacology and a nursing program, and she sent me a, an email. She's in my pathophysiology. And she said, you know, the whole time you kept saying that over and over again, I was like, please. Like I'm really going to use all this again. And she said, we're two weeks into the class, and I'm using all my physiology stuff again. So definitely remember it. I don't, I'm not here to give you stuff that you never, ever will hear or use again. I'm here to give you stuff that really helps, except for this, because this is damn fun. So well, before we understood about pharmacology, there were all these different things out there. Like heroin, we took it. We didn't know what the heck it was for, but it made us feel good. So we thought, ah, just give it. And then we realized that things like heroin would actually slow your breathing rate. It would suppress coughs. So we'd start prescribing it as like a cough medication. Well, heroin's primarily for pain. It slows down activity of other neurons. If you take too much heroin, guess what it does to your breathing? Stops your breathing. Yeah, so they actually used to give heroin to like kids for coughs. Well, come on. Um, another funny thing about heroin is you used to actually buy it through uh, Sears and Roebuck catalogs. You could buy this little... It was like a stainless steel, or stainless steel, um, certainly silver case that came with one syringe and three vials of heroin, and you could buy it just like through the mail. The good old days. The good old days, right? 
And the reason they did that is because it was barbaric for women to drink alcohol, but it was more ladylike for them to have this little thing on their coffee table. And if you know the guys were drinking beer, then she could just slip, you know, slip her skirt up and just inject it right into the femoral artery and take her head of heroin. So, so it was more ecstasy. ladylike. They used to prescribe ecstasy to like. Couples that were having relationship problems, yeah, yeah because... Until just, like, not that long ago. Yep, LSD they used to give to yeah. psychiatrists so that they could experience what it was like to be schizophrenic. Right. Yeah. Most of the, no, most no, of the no, drugs no, out no, there that no. we use nowadays were illegal, you know, like, well, they were considered illegal. illegal. until they figure out what part of the brain... The right, until we have too much fun with it, then they take right. it away. <laughs> they tried that with alcohol, prohibition, that didn't fly. But, yeah, it used to be considered non-addictive. In fact, they would give people heroin to get them off of alcohol. If you were an alcoholic, they say, oh, you take this heroin, you won't, even, you won't even think about that alcohol anymore, and you'll be off of it. Well, they were. They were off alcohol, and they were on the heroin, so now they're a heroin addict. But, yeah, like cough medicines, 40% alcohol, and the rest was opiates. It's brilliant. You know, either you got better, you died, or you didn't care. You know? And then for newborn babies, yeah, it made them feel less pain when they were teething, but unfortunately it helped them not breathe, so from cradle to grave. So it's just kind of funny. And I had some other ones that I don't I think I can actually show them. I thought we would have a little more time, but um, cocaine, legal at one time, right? Freud used to chew the coca leaves, and he'd, he'd be high. He'd be working with his patients, and he was high the whole time. But if they had extracted cocaine from the coca leaves and he had snorted it, yeah, he would have been dead way before that. Um, cocaine, they used to put in wines, and the Pope actually blessed it. said, this is a blessing from God. And the Pope always carried a bottle of this wine that had cocaine in it. Yeah. Got a Vatican gold medal and everything. You could buy it over the counter, have it a glass with dinner, but children could only have a half glass. Right? Rub it on your teeth a little bit. Rub it in your gums. If you had stress, anxiety from performance, like if you're a teacher or whatever, we get really stressed out and need a little of cocaine, just go to the cough drops. Right. So, yeah, and I already talked about Freud. But what's interesting is that back during Prohibition, you couldn't do what? Drink alcohol. So cocaine was introduced. They took it out of the wine. They put it in soda. So you could buy it over the, the counter and just drink it. And, of course, that made what drink really famous? Coca-Cola, right? So it was cola beans, which had a lot of caffeine, and then cocaine extract in it. So people loved it. You come in and relax after work and not have a beer, you'd have a glass of Coca-Cola. Kids come in with their nickel. And, it's amazing what you could buy for a nickel back in the day, right? <laughs> but processes like dopamine, nicotine affects us. This is crazy. So look at the non-smoker's brain. These yellow areas are the areas that are active with dopamine. All lit up. Dopamine makes you feel good, you know, it helps you think clearly, it helps your muscles work better. You take a smoker, have them smoke for a while, and deprive them of cigarette smoke, look what happens to the dopamine activity in their brain. It's no wonder they're so pissy when they're going off of cigarettes, right? Their dopamine's so low, and they're just bitter and angry all the time. And that's exactly it. Because when they, when they take the nicotine, it starts bringing their happiness level back up. So when they start crashing, they're like, Argh. they take another cigarette, and they feel better. It's crazy. Um, even lithium that we use for bipolar disorder, so mood issues now, it was in soda. We didn't know what the heck it did, so we put it in soda, and it made people happy when they drank the soda. So they, they called it the bubbly that made you bubbly. And originally it was in the stuff called Bib Labeled Lithiated Lemon Lime Cola. And, uh, did they actually have a question mark? It wasn't. Yeah, it was actually, when they changed the name because they took out the lithium, then they changed the name to 7-Up, which was actually my next slide, but for some reason it never works. So, that slide, yeah. So it became 7-Up after they took the lithium out of it. But it's just kind of really cool when you look at the processes, and you don't have to know these processes for this class. They're just interesting things to know. But most of this, the drugs that were, you know, are illegal today were illegal at one time, and some of them are coming back. Marijuana. Yeah. Yeah, like, like you were saying, ecstasy and everything. Well, but, and that's like, what is it, the... Get what it is, but you can still buy it at like tobacco sh or smoke shops or whatever. And they can't, the reason they can't outlaw is because they can't figure out what part of the brain it's affecting, but it basically like slips you into cartoon world for a couple minutes and then you snap back out of it. No, not bad salts. I don't know. And then there's the chemical that's in, um, the stuff from from Euro Trip that they were drinking. Now you can buy it in the Salvia, that's what it is. Salvia. You can still buy that, at least in California at head shops. And What's the drink? What's the drink that... That you like do with the, the shrimp and stuff? Yeah, what's called? 
absinthe. Yeah. yeah. In the United States, you can buy it, but it doesn't have that whatever white wood yeah, it extract in it. Flavor, yeah. yeah. It's not the same. It just tastes terrible. Okay, we're down a little bit.